Court documents say the actor Alec Baldwin was handed a loaded gun. He was told it was safe, but pulling the trigger led to the death of the crew member on set. The emergency call for help has also been released. Two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Also this afternoon, the government tries to reset its vaccination programme, saying it could mean no more lockdowns. Half a billion in the budgets for families, but Labour say it's a smokescreen after a decade of cuts. And the dads who lost daughters to suicide, but touched many hearts on their long walk to save others. It's the awareness that is the crucial bit for me. If we can save one other life, then we've done something. This is ITV News with Gamal Van Berlin. Good afternoon. After the horror of the movie set killing, it's now been revealed that the actor Alec Baldwin was told the prop gun he fired was safe. According to court documents, an assistant director wrongly said it was OK to use, apparently not knowing it contained live ammunition. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was fatally shot in the chest while the director who was standing behind her was injured. The dramatic phone call to the emergency services from someone on the set has also now been released. Our correspondent Robert Moore reports from Santa Fe in New Mexico, where the movie was being filmed. We are learning more about the circumstances of the tragedy on the film set here, even if the central mystery of how it was allowed to happen remains. Police believe that Alec Baldwin, seen here distraught in the hours after the shooting, was told by a member of the film crew that the gun he was handling was cold. In other words, was not loaded and did not pose a threat. And yet, minutes later, the talented young cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot dead. Audio has been released of the emergency call. An assistant on the film set pleading for help. No, uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has had two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. So was it loaded with a real bullet or one? We don't, I, don't, I cannot tell you that. Okay. Is there any serious bleeding? I don't know. I ran out of the building. The entertainment industry this weekend is mourning the loss of Hutchins, who filmed herself on horseback at the ranch just two days earlier. There are reports here that there were several complaints on the set of poor safety protocols, even involving the handling of guns during the filming of this western. Vehicles continue to come and go inside the ranch where the tragedy unfolded. I am told the investigation will last at least several more days, and the film industry also is trying to learn important lessons. Alec Baldwin, photographed here hours before the shooting in his period costume and ironically with theatrical blood on his body, has been fully cooperating with investigators. Many who work in the industry say the problem was not a single blunder, but rather multiple failures, ones that raise serious questions for the film business. Sir so Robert, two days after this tragic shooting, the film set there is still sealed off by investigators. Absolutely. It's a highly active scene. Lots for investigators still to look at. Not least uh, the ballistics and forensics. What exactly was fired out of that antique gun being used by Alec Baldwin on the set? There are also eyewitnesses in particular uh, trying to understand from the uh, the position known as the armourer on the set, among uh, the member of the, the film crew, also known as the weapons master, who is the individual who's meant to keep close track of all the guns and the ammunition on the set. That's important. But there is also here a broader issue, I think, for the entire film industry. Rust was a Western movie being made here on a very tight budget of about $6 million. And so that raises serious questions. And we know uh, that maybe uh, crew members and uh, some of the actors were concerned about safety uh, corners being cut, in particular, not just about the, the, the handling of weapons, but also about COVID so, uh, safety protocols. So overall, for the film industry, amid, amid uh, sort of tightening budgets, these are issues being raised, not just for this film set, but for the entire industry. OK, Robert, thank you. 
Well, here the government has taken steps to refresh its COVID vaccine programme in England amid rising cases. From today, 12 to 15-year-olds can be jabbed at walking clinics and the former head of the original vaccine rollout is being brought back to try and increase the take-up of booster jabs. Ministers say it's how they will avoid a winter lockdown, but some scientists say it's already too late. Mark Ballard says more. With each shot on the arm, we add another brick to our wall of defence against COVID. And the push to get as many booster jabs into the arms of those eligible is being felt at this vaccination centre on the world. 12 months ago, it was we were all talking about older people, vulnerable people. Now it is the unvaccinated younger people who are becoming the vulnerable people. Boris Johnson and his ministers remain confident that the COVID jabs will get us safely through winter, whether through boosters or getting more of those who haven't been vaccinated to come forward. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, has told The Times that a successful booster rollout will prevent significant economic restrictions from having to be imposed. And so the government has drafted back in Dr Emily Lawson, who was in charge of the vaccine rollout until April of this year. More pharmacies are being enlisted too, but with levels of infection continuing to rise, scientists say vaccinations alone won't provide enough protection. It's a modern triumph that we've managed to produce so many highly effective vaccines in such a short time scale. It's absolutely remarkable, but alone they're not good enough. You know, the vaccines need to be combined with other measures in order to control a, um, a pandemic with this level of infectiousness. And even after the third dose at this vaccination centre in Ealing, people say they're remaining cautious. Do you think you'll keep, you think you'll keep wearing it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But um, I would be less worried, but I would still take precautions with the mask and everything, yeah. Watching the television, you have to, when you see the, you see the result daily. So you have to feel a bit worried. 12 to 15-year-olds are also being offered a COVID vaccine. The government hoping more COVID jabs will enable it to resist calls to tighten restrictions. But a number of local directors of public health in England have deviated from government guidance and are already recommending the introduction of some of the so-called Plan B measures. Mark Mallett, ITV News. The Chancellor's budget is approaching this coming Wednesday, and today we learned some of the first details of what will be in it. The Treasury have announced a series of spending pledges, including £7 billion for Metro Mayors to pioneer local transport schemes. There's also £500 million for supporting young children and families. Our political correspondent, Harry Horton, reports. They say parenting is the hardest job. Next week, the government aims to help by putting early years at the heart of its autumn budget. £500 million will be spent on 75 family hubs, offering support and advice. One MP who campaigned for early years investment says the hubs will make a huge difference. To give every baby the chance at the best start for life is really transformational for our society. And then I think the critical laser intervention is offering birth registration in family hubs. I think if we do that, then everybody, you know, whoever they are, wherever they come from, will go to a family hub to register their baby's birth. It's an opportunity to show them what other services are available, what other help they can get. Labour says the money doesn't make up for the closure of thousands of children's centres over the past decade. I think it's a tacit admission that the closure of Sure Start centres was a mistake. Um, this, of course, doesn't come close to replacing the network of Sure Start and children's centres that we've lost. The investment is part of a raft of spending announcements ahead of next week's budget. £700 million for grassroots sports clubs, £850 million for museums and galleries and almost £7 billion invested in regional transport schemes in Yorkshire, the West Midlands and Manchester. Northern leaders have welcomed the transport money but worry it means bigger projects such as high-speed rail could be scaled back. The problem is that without the full delivery of HS2 building from the north, starting from Leeds down to Sheffield, without Northern Powerhouse Rail and a new station in Bradford, the north of England will be shortchanged. What we'll see is levelling down rather than levelling up. The Chancellor wants to use his budget to get the government's agenda back on track. But after the pandemic, money is tight and some sectors could end up with less than they hoped for. And uh, Harry's with me now. So the government have revealed these measures um, early, 
presumably because they're giving away money, but in every budget, there's a also take. Yeah, that's right. People like to hear about more money being spent, of course. That's why we get these announcements in the run-up to the budget. But the government also knows there's been colossal public spending over the past 18 months because of the pandemic. The Chancellor wants to try and claw back some of that money. Now, broadly speaking, there's two ways he can do that. One is by raising taxes. Uh, the other is by cutting spending elsewhere. We'll get those details, that part of the budget, uh, on Wednesday. And I think it's within that context that we can properly understand how significant these spending announcements actually are. OK, Harry, thank you. And uh, we will bring you the budgets live here on ITV on Wednesday in a special programme presented by Tom Bradbury. The cost of living has been rising. We've already had a slew of tax rises. Our national borrowing has been eye-watering. So just what can we expect this Wednesday as the Chancellor talks us through his budget. I'll have live coverage of the statement and I'll be joined by our team of editors to make sense of what it means for you and the country. Do join me for the Chancellor's budget from 12.15 on Wednesday on ITV. In other news today, and the AA says petrol prices are nearing a record high this weekend, in part because retailers are using them to subsidise the even higher cost of diesel. The AA says based on its wholesale cost right now, petrol should be about 2.5 pence cheaper per litre. Saudi Arabia has pledged to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2060. The kingdom has more than doubled its annual greenhouse gas reduction target, but it will continue to produce oil and gas for exports. And heavy rains have caused flash flooding in eastern Spain. Four inches fell in parts of Alicante, causing significant damage to homes and businesses. Uh, on to sport now, and the lunchtime kickoff in the Premier League was between the top and bottom teams. So you might have thought it would be a one sided affair. Well, sadly for Norwich, it was. 7 0 to Chelsea. Chris Gudder has all the goals. Top versus bottom on paper, a mismatch. In practice, a mismatch. Norwich had a mountain to climb when Mason Mount got Chelsea's first. A double-barrelled assault from hudson Adoy doubled the advantage. And a striker's finish from defender Rhys James put Norwich out of the match. At this rate, a recipe for relegation. Chelsea, in contrast, have all the ingredients for a title tilt. Ben Chilwell's finish for the fourth was ruthless. And for Norwich, the fifth was just cruel. Tim Cruel with the final touch into his own net. Ben Gibson sending off for two yellow cards didn't help. And a defender even turned goalkeeper, except he is not allowed to handle. Penalty to Chelsea, 6-0. And they'd almost lost count when Mount got his third and Chelsea's seventh goal. It's easy at the top but it's certainly no laughing matter at the bottom. Chris Scudder, ITV News. And Wembley will shortly be hosting a Women's World Cup qualifier between England and Northern Ireland. Coverage starts in just a few minutes here on ITV, straight after the news and weather. Now, England have made a great start to the 2020 World Cup in the Middle East against the defending champions, West Indies. England have been outstanding with the ball so far. This was the key wicket of big hitting Chris Gale, out for 13 thanks to a fabulous Dawid Malin catch. A few minutes ago, the West Indies had lost seven wickets for just 44. Finally, three fathers who all lost their daughters to suicide have completed a 320-mile walk across England. Andy Airy, Mike Palmer and Tim Owen were cheered across the finishing line in Norfolk this morning, having set out from Cumbria 15 days ago. On the way, they received backing from Hollywood stars Daniel Craig and Nicole Kidman, whose donations helped the trio raise over half a million pounds for the suicide prevention charity Papyrus. The prime aim of our walk was to raise awareness, and we've, I think we've done that. The, the money's nice, but I think if any of our daughters had known about the charity, then perhaps, just perhaps, at least one of them might not have taken their, their own lives. So it's the awareness that is the crucial bit for me. If we can save one other life, then we've done something. And that's it. I'm back with the late news at 10.30. Until then, have a great evening. Bye-bye for now.